Tanya Ryder disappeared on Thursday, September 20th, 2007. When a person disappears without a trace, often the most critical information is hidden in their actions and words from the days before they vanished. Tanya Ryder's last known whereabouts may hold the clues to what happened to her. A hardworking woman heads home to catch some sleep after her overnight shift. As far as I knew, Tanya was just going about her normal day. She would have been getting off work and then heading home. But she never makes it. All of a sudden, she's not where she's supposed to be. She disappeared into thin air, as far as we could tell. Without a single clue, her husband must search for her alone. Not knowing is enough to make you go insane. Tom is having the battle of his life. I was waging a one-man battle against overwhelming odds just to even get heard. To reach the shocking conclusion that turns into a media sensation. Whoa, what's going on here? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Thursday, September 20th, 2000. Seeing the fitting room at a department store. She was a dedicated worker. If she said she would be there five minutes early or 15 minutes early, she was there on the dime. Tanya's husband, 39-year-old Tom Ryder, also works two jobs. By day, he clears land for new housing. By night, he delivers pizza. We were working insane hours, but we had a goal in sight. They're building their dream house, overlooking the tranquil Puget Sound. Well, the idea behind all of this work and all of these hours was to make sure we had enough money to complete the house. Well, they felt that if they put in a lot of hard work and a lot of long hours, that they could eventually slow down and enjoy the house and each other. Tanya and Tom have been happily married for seven years. Like many couples, their personalities are actually quite different. Tom is very vocal, very jovial, very outspoken. He's a prankster, whereas Tanya is very quiet. She doesn't speak unless she has something to say, and Tom will just talk your ear off. I'm an outgoing, boisterous idiot. Tanya's the other half of me. She's able to keep me in line. If you have Tawny here, you have Tom there to balance her. This is the marriage made in heaven. For now, Tom and Tanya Ryder are living in a house in Maple Valley. Their heavy-duty routine leaves them with little time to relax. They pass through the house at different times and can easily go three or four days without seeing each other. We had to schedule a time when our days off matched to actually even say hello. That's pretty crazy. On Wednesday evening, Tom and Tanya enjoy a rare moment of togetherness. She was home that night when I got home, so we actually got to talk a little bit and have a little you know, family time. I made her laugh, she made me laugh. Later that night, Tanya works her overnight shift at the grocery store in Bellevue. At 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, Tanya leaves the store and starts to head home. Well, as far as I knew, Tanya was just going about her normal day. I mean, she would have been getting off work at 9 o'clock, having breakfast, and then heading home. Little does Tom know, Tanya never makes it home that day. Three days since Tom last saw Tanya, he's on the job, clearing a housing tract in Maple Valley. The city was requiring the wetlands be cleared of all what they called hostile vegetation, which is like blackberry bushes. Around 10 a.m., Tom's cell phone rings. It's Tanya's boss at her daytime job in Bellevue. She tells me that Tanya hasn't showed up to her last two shifts. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to get Tanya in trouble. Maybe uh, 
Maybe she just overslept. I'm trying to keep my calm and telling her, uh, well, I'll, I'll try and get a hold of Tanya and have her call you. Concerned, Tom immediately calls Tanya's cell phone. I started walking back to my truck and dialing Tanya's phone number. She didn't set up her voicemail, so it goes to the little message that says, the cellular customer you are trying to reach has not set up his voice mailbox yet. Mailbox cannot accept new messages at this time. Please try again later. Goodbye. She may not answer anyone else's calling in, but she'll answer mine. So now I'm starting to worry. Tom drives to their home in Maple Valley, thinking that perhaps Tanya is there. I make it to the door and I go, Tanya! And no answer, so I go and I check the downstairs. I double back and go up the staircase. And we have three bedrooms up there. And she's not in any of them. Tom checks the garage. Tanya's car is not there. The more I'm checking and not finding her, the, the more the panic is building inside me. Desperate to locate Tanya, Tom makes an emergency phone call. 911, what are you reporting? My wife didn't show up for work last night, and she's not home, and I haven't heard from her in two days. Can you just check and see if there are any accidents involved on your rider, R-I-D-E-R? I'm not showing any injury accidents in that area, but I can connect you with State Patrol, and you can check if there are any injury accidents on the freeway. The 911 operator tells him there are no reports of an accident on the highway either. But this doesn't bring Tom any relief. In a single morning, Tom's world is turned upside down. So at this point, I start to just, I'm losing it. I start thinking about what could have happened. For Tom, the reality of the situation starts to set in. No one has seen Tanya since she left her overnight shift at the grocery store Thursday morning. Tom realizes, oh my god. She's been gone and unaccounted for in everybody's life for two days. Coming up, the clock is ticking, and Tom is struggling to get police to investigate Tanya's disappearance. I was furious. I was not going to let them not do their job. Thirty-nine-year-old Tom Ryder has just learned that his wife, Tanya, has not reported for work in 48 hours. She's not at home either, and she's not answering her cell phone. I'm pretty much starting to panic at this point, because Tanya will answer my phone calls when I call. All of a sudden, she's not where she's supposed to be. He knew there was something wrong. My adrenaline was pumping. I was having trouble breathing right. It's just, where is she? There is one more place Tom Ryder thinks to check. I'm headed to her second job, just in case that's my last safe possibility that's in my brain is that they've changed her shift and she had to work at her second job. On the highway to Bellevue, Tom keeps trying her cell phone. There's no answer. So, of course, his mind starts playing mind games, the what if. Has someone kidnapped her? Is she alive? Is she dead? Somebody stole her car. Somebody robbed her at gunpoint. She's got amnesia, and she's in the hospital, and they stole her wallet and have her ID. All these different possibilities are just flooding into my mind. Nearing Bellevue, Tom calls 911 again. This time, he wants to report his wife missing. 911 connects him with the Bellevue Police Department, and they make arrangements to meet him and interview him to see what's going on with his wife. Minutes later, Tom arrives at the department store where Tanya works. He meets the store manager, and they start talking before the police arrive. The manager tells Tom that Tanya is due at the store within the hour for her regular shift at 1 o'clock that day. Tom waits anxiously to see if Tanya will show up for work. My brain is still trying to cling to the safe possibilities. It's still trying to, to believe that she's going to be here and everything's going to be all right. One o'clock passes. No Tanya. 
when she had a schedule, she stuck to it. And so Tom knows that when she has not shown up for work, he has a reason to be really alarmed. For Tom, there is no longer any question about it. Tanya has truly disappeared. It was painful and scary, and it was like someone had just torn duct tape off of my eyes. I was in a mode that I hope no one ever has to go through. Soon, responding to Tom's 911 call, a Bellevue police officer arrives at the department store. He questions Tom. What does your wife look like? When was the last time she was seen? What was she wearing? Have there been any disputes between you? The officer determines Tanya's last known whereabouts were at her nighttime job. Immediately, they call the grocery store to speak with Tanya's boss, who is able to locate a security video that shows Tanya leaving the store at 9 a.m. on Thursday, September 20th. It's the last time anyone sees Tanya Ryder. The tape showed Tanya leaving, walking into the parking lot, apparently normal, no one was following her. They do have her leaving at 9 o'clock in the morning, Thursday the 20th, and getting into her car and driving away. She didn't look stressed, like she was being followed. Because the tape shows Tanya heading home to Maple Valley in her own car, on her own free will, the officer informs Tom he will have to refile a report with the King County Police. John Urquhart is a sergeant at that precinct. Bellevue decided she lives in Maple Valley, our jurisdiction. Therefore, the King County Sheriff's Office will have jurisdiction. Tom immediately heads back to his home in Maple Valley. I know, based on a conversation I had with the officer, that I won't get referred to the right 911 operator until I get closer to home. As soon as he crosses the county line, Tom calls 911 from the car. This time, he's connected to a King County emergency operator. My wife is missing. My wife's name is Tanya Ryder. He goes through the story again, and he couldn't find any record of her being in an automobile accident, so there had to be some other explanation what had happened to her. And he was quite insistent. Something else is going on here. You need to help me. Tom urges the King County operator to file a missing persons report for Tanya. But the operator declines to file the report. Before anything else can happen, the operator tells Tom, he must check the local hospitals and jails for Tanya. The moment that I'm making those phone calls, calling the jails, calling the morgues, calling the hospitals, I'm praying that it's the wrong way, that I'm looking in the wrong direction, but I have to look. There's no record of Tanya anywhere. So I call back the 911 operator. She's not in any of your jails. She's not in any of your hospitals. She's not in any of your morgues. She's not at home. My wife is missing. For a second time, Tom asks the operator to file a missing persons report for Tanya. Just because she's missed work, have you, did you guys have any arguments? No. Discussions, just problems? Have you checked any other family members in Find the area? house in Maple Valley. Have you contacted any other family members that she may go to? And talk to her family members. Again, the operator declines to file the report, insisting that Tom must try contacting Tanya's friends and family members. History has told us, in other cases, it's very, very important for family members to be contacted. Oftentimes, that'll solve the case very quickly. I haven't called her family in years. I called each and every one of them. And they didn't have a close relationship, and they haven't heard from her in months. Tom calls King County 911 a third time. He knows with each passing minute, Tanya could be in danger. So he pleads with the operator to take the report so the search for Tanya can begin. He's very, very insistent. He says, I've called the family members, I've called the hospitals, I've called the morgue, I've called the jail. I've done all you've asked me to do. They're going to have to take a report now. Now it's their turn, is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, now they're going to come on board. Now they're going to start looking for my wife. But instead, the operator declines to file a missing persons report for a third time. He cites certain criteria that Tanya's disappearance must meet before it becomes an active case. Is the person suicidal? Are they being treated for a mental health issue? Are they elderly? Is there some sort of suspicious circumstance that surrounds their disappearance? 
But Tanya's disappearance does not meet any of them. Can you send an officer over to at least take the report? Officers don't take these reports in person. She does not meet criteria for to take a missing persons report on. She is an adult. She's not been suicidal. What we're telling you is that she doesn't How meet the feel she, she doesn't meet the criteria. Tomorrow. Okay. What we're telling you is that she doesn't meet the criteria. Okay. We don't go actively searching for missing people, sir. Even the checkbooks are here. I'm telling you, something has happened to my wife. The 911 operator suggests to Tom that Tanya likely left on her own. She's a normal, adult, working female, and she disappeared, which is her right. She's over the age of 18. She's an adult. She can go where she wants, and she doesn't have to tell you. Shocked by the operator's refusal to file a missing persons report, Tom struggles to contain his anger. You're treating it like, oh, well, this idiot, his wife just left him, and all oh, hell with it. How long does she have to be missing before you'll take a report? There is no set time. What you're telling me is unless she turns up dead, you're not going to care. At this point, I am trying very hard to keep an even keel in my voice. If I knew where he was, I would have been down there forcing his hand to write the report. Four days after she was last seen, no official search for Tanya Ryder is underway. Three 911 calls from Tom Ryder have failed to initiate an investigation, and he fears that the longer it takes to start looking for her, the less likely they will find her alive. If Tanya is in danger, the police need to get involved, and the clock is ticking. Tom, at this point, is at a loss for what to do without any help, so he has to take it on himself. Tom contemplates going to the police station to make his case in person, but he fears that they, too, will reject his plea to start an investigation. Instead, he decides to take matters into his own hands by involving the media. I figure I'm going to force their hand. I figure I'm not going to let them not look for my wife. I'm going to call the media and make it loud and messy. But the news station requires a police-issued case number in order to run a missing person story to avoid inadvertently reporting false information. It's a catch-22 because they can't run a story without a case number. And on the other hand, Tom can't get a case number. He has opened every door to obtain an answer, to point him in the right direction, to give him the next step, and all the doors are slammed in his face. All he can do now is try to search for Tanya on his own. As night falls across the Northwest, Tom Ryder drives up and down the roads of Maple Valley, Washington, looking for his missing wife. I was just driving back and forth, uh, scanning the edges of the road, looking for any indication that a car had left the roadway. He's looking everywhere. He's looking in people's windows as he drives by. He's looking for accident scenes. He's looking for grease on the highway. I lost count on how many times I went back and forth. I was panicking. Late that night, Tom thinks of one final scenario. Perhaps Tanya has retreated to the site of their future dream house. Maybe she's just frazzled and she's out at the property trying to relax her nerves. I'm not believing it for one second, but there's no way I'm not going to go check. Tom drives 92 miles to see if Tanya is there, but she is still nowhere to be found. Hours are ticking by, minutes are ticking by, and Tanya is still missing. Coming up, Tom fights to get his wife's case activated. These people aren't helping me. In fact, they're standing in my way. And inside me, something snapped. Thirty-nine year old Tom Ryder is devastated. His wife Tanya has disappeared. It's crazy. The man was trying to hold it together as his life is falling apart. He's also furious. Despite repeated calls to 911, Tom can't get police to launch a missing persons case. I was waging a one-man battle against overwhelming odds just to even get heard. But time is of the essence, and Tom knows he needs the police if he has any chance of finding his wife. 
I know I can't do it all myself. I know I need their help. The chances of finding her were better with more people looking. Four days have now passed since Tanya Ryder went missing. Tom makes his fourth call in 48 hours to 911. Operator 65. Uh, Tom Ryder again. This time, to Tom's surprise, he gets a different response. This different operator made a different subjective decision from the standpoint that Tom had done everything else we would asked him to do, and she's still not home. I believe that she suddenly met the criteria because they figured out that I wasn't going to go away. What's going to happen is we're going to list her, and if someone runs her name anywhere in the, in the country, they will know that she is missing, and they'll call. The King County Police finally agree to take a missing persons report. And he's really kind of shocked. Wow, the door opened. The name Tanya Ryder is finally in the system. And they said, well, we're going to send an officer out to take your statement. And that was a great relief for Tom. He couldn't relax, but at least he could grab a breath. Five hours later, a King County police officer arrives at Tom's home in Maple Valley. He hasn't even gotten out of the car yet, and I'm standing there waiting for him at his door. I tell him the same things that I told the 911 operator. I need your help to find my wife. Tom invites the officer to search his home. Yeah, I say, if you'd like to search my house, you don't need a warrant. You can look right now. Tom wants the police department to know, I want you to do whatever you have to do in the least amount of time to do it in order to find my wife. There's something wrong. I feel like she's in danger. Although Tom is being very forthcoming, in these cases, the husband often becomes the number one suspect. He asked me to wait in the driveway because he wants to search the house without me leading him or anything like that. We're real interested in kind of looking around and determine, did she pack a bag or her personal items missing, uh, wallet, credit cards, money, that sort of thing. He doesn't see any blood spatter. He doesn't see furniture turned upside down. He doesn't see any indication of dispute. He noticed the things that I was telling him, that her paychecks were on the banister, her bank card was on the counter. Nothing was missing from the house, and in fact, uh, some of her credit cards were still there. The officer tells Tom that a King County sergeant will still have to determine whether or not a detective will take the case. So again, Tom is kind of one step forward, two steps back. But meanwhile, Tanya's disappearance has a case number now, so the media will run the story. He gets it out on the news to let the public know that his wife is missing. Bellevue police say a surveillance tape shows the 33-year-old 5-foot, 10-inch blonde woman getting into her car and driving away as normal as can be. Tom says there is no reason for her to run away, and now he's putting up a $25,000 reward to help find her. I called every local media outlet at this point. I was going to make sure there was going to be an investigation. It's the fifth day since Tanya Ryder went missing. After another sleepless night, Tom goes to work. It's the only thing I knew to keep my mind from going over the endless scenario of possibilities. If I was doing nothing, I was thinking these horrific thoughts. After seeing all the news coverage, Tom's boss asks his employees to draw up hundreds of flyers. They email copies to as many people as they can. By 10 o'clock that morning, they had flyers from Canada all the way down to Oregon and all the way over to Utah. They, of all the people, knew what type of a couple Tom and Tanya Ryder were and how devastated Tom was. So anything that they could do and jump in and help him, they were there. At King County Police Headquarters, officials finally decide to hand Tanya's case to a detective. So we didn't find anything that really told us she left voluntarily, nothing that said she didn't leave voluntarily or had been a victim of foul play. So at that point, there certainly was enough questions as to where she was, so the detectives needed to do follow-up work beginning first thing Monday morning. To start the investigation, the detective needs Tanya's banking information so police can track any recent activity on her accounts. 
we asked Tom what kind of credit cards or checking accounts does she have. They need credit card information. They need bank statements and accounts and PIN numbers and codes. I told him that we had a joint account and a joint savings account, and that Tanya had a Nordstrom visa, and that's all she has with her. Later that day, Tom tries again to reach Tanya. He can't let go of the feeling that she's out there somewhere. I, I decided to try and call her phone again because it's been giving me this weird feeling of knowing if her phone's still alive, maybe she is. And when I called this time, it went straight to the message. It didn't ring at all, which meant the battery died. Whatever hope Tom has that Tanya is alive evaporates. There's nothing left that I can do. I've done everything that I can do. And inside me, something snapped. I kind of fell down, and I couldn't get up. Can't move. Just when he's lost all hope, Tom's cell phone rings. It's the King County investigator. With some incredible news, police have tracked activity on one of Tanya's bank accounts. We're going, whoa, what's going on here? Somebody's using that card. Coming up, a surprising tip leads police to an unexpected interrogation. And something's not right with this guy's story. And something's just not right with this guy's story. Get more Disappeared online at investigation.discovery.com. Thirty-nine-year-old Tom Ryder is experiencing the single worst trauma of his life. His wife, Tanya, has disappeared. I'm feeling hopeless. I'm feeling completely powerless. But four days after Tanya's disappearance, police think they have a break. There is some activity on one of Tanya's bank accounts. The detective calls Tom and lets him know that there's a ray of hope. It basically gave me the impression that Tanya was alive that she was out there and she was okay. Tom calls the detective on his wife's case to inquire about the details of the new discovery. I ask her specifically what account she was monitoring that she saw activity on. She said, I saw activity on Tanya's checking account. As far as we knew, she had the only access to the account. Therefore, any activity on the account would be through her debit card. Unfortunately, there is a mix-up with the account information. I said, that's a joint account. That was me. I put the gas in my truck because I was out looking for her and ran out of cash. Tom realized it was his purchase off of the card, and it was nothing to do with Tanya. And so he was, again, devastated. Amid the confusion, one thing becomes clear. There is no activity on any of the accounts that connect to Tanya Ryder. Which means there are still no leads in the case, no evidence to suggest foul play, and no clues to where Tanya Ryder might be. There has to be some evidence of where she might be to give us a starting point. And we didn't have that. Again, she disappeared into thin air, as far as we could tell. Now that the bank records are a dead end, Tom demands police start physically searching for Tanya. A natural reaction for people is, call out search and rescue, call out your helicopter, go look for her. But police insist that without a hard lead, there's little point beginning a search. Remember, we've got her leaving the city of Bellevue, driving 20 some miles to Maple Valley. That's a big area. So where do you search for Tanya Ryder? The reality is, you don't because she could have gone anywhere. Tom also demands that they check Tanya's cell phone records. He's also thinking, why can't they get information from the cell phone company? I knew they had the ability to trace a cell phone's location to within a cell tower's radius. But legally, the cell phone company can't just give that kind of information to police. The problem is, people have a right to privacy. People expect that the police are not going to be able to trace their movements unless there's a reason to do so. 
In order to obtain the records, the phone company requires a warrant. But King County police can't get one. In the state of Washington, to get a search warrant, you have to have probable cause to believe a crime has been committed. And at this point, we did not have probable cause to believe a crime had been committed. We didn't have an inkling or a suspicion that crime had been committed, much less probable cause. With no other leads in sight, King County detectives continued to pursue Tanya's cell phone records. Meanwhile, Tom is breaking down from the seemingly hopeless investigation. Tom is beside himself. He's sleep deprived. He can't keep food down. And he starts breaking down. He's wasting away mentally and physically. When you're living through it, it is 100% nightmare. It is everything in your world slows down to a crawl. I was losing all control. And the whole time, you cannot take your mind off of the well-being of your loved one. But the situation is about to get far worse for Tom. Tanya's boss at the grocery store where she was last seen calls police to voice doubts about him. This is calling from the Bellevue Fred Meyer store because I wanted to get some information for somebody because one of my employees is missing. Um, something's not right with this guy's story. And I just need to let somebody know that. Something's just not right with this guy's story. Eight days have now passed since Tanya Ryder disappeared. The recent suspicion raised by Tanya's boss is the only thing police have to go on. So they turn their attention to the husband, a usual suspect in these types of cases. But they have no evidence against Tom Ryder. We have to eliminate people from being a suspect in cases like this. And certainly the husband uh, is the number one suspect. Absent some other sort of evidence that might implicate him, what we decided to do was give him a lie detector test, put him on the polygraph, and see how he does. I get a call from the detective. Uh, can you come in for an interview? No problem. I got nothing to hide. They just wanted to get some facts straight. Tom heads to the Kent Justice Center, where he sits for a preliminary interview before the polygraph. As the interview progresses, the nature of the questions starts to irritate Tom. Was your wife all right the last time you saw her? Uh, was your wife unharmed? Did you do anything to anger her? So it's just, you know, did you hurt your wife? Everything except for did you kill your wife? Tom gets the feeling police are doubting his innocence. They were trying to coax a confession out of me. They had made up their minds that I had done something. All he could think of was, are they waiting for me to stand up and scream, I'm guilty, I murdered her? I wasn't fully aware of just how rattled I already was. It was like, this is it. They're going to be crucifying me down here. Aching with fatigue, Tom feels the walls closing in on him. My wife never laid a hand on her, never raised a finger to her. You know, I haven't done anything. I knew I was at my breaking point. Coming up, the stunning conclusion to Tanya Ryder's mysterious disappearance. So we put detectives out looking to see what they could find. I mean, it's a needle in a haystack. In the span of one week, Tom Ryder has gone from a loving husband to a person being questioned about his wife's disappearance. Now, Tanya's boss is raising suspicions about Tom to the police. Uh, something's not right with this guy's story. And I just need to let somebody know that. Something's just not right with this guy's story. Since there are no other leads in the case, police ask Tom Ryder to take a polygraph. He's thinking these people want to prove me guilty. They wanted me to rule myself out or convict myself. While following up on the lead from Tanya's boss, police are still pursuing a warrant so the phone company can release Tanya's cell phone records. This is something that took time and a tremendous amount of frustration that we couldn't get to those cell phone records. Finally, there's a break. 
A sympathetic judge signs the warrant, and police are able to retrieve Tanya's cell phone records. The information they obtain takes the investigation in a completely new direction. The detectives were able to look at the records and determine which tower was accessed. They were able to narrow that down into essentially a pie-shaped area three to five miles out in a particular direction. The latest is that it's actually hitting off the southeast of that tower. We can give you the latitude longitude of that tower. Within this area is the highway Tanya Ryder takes on her daily commute. So now we know she was probably on her way home. So we put detectives out walking down that highway, looking to see what they could find. We fan out on each side of the roadway and just start walking down the shoulder. And this is a state highway. There's a lot of traffic, 50,000 cars a day on this roadway. I mean, it's a needle in a haystack. As detectives are grilling Tom Ryder, police continue with the Maple Valley Fire Department to search desperately for any clues. It could have been just the phone tossed out of the car, or it could be the whole car, or nothing at all. At 3.20 PM, officials make an astonishing discovery. Uh, we found the vehicle about a quarter mile south of the south end of Jones Road. He finds the car down an embankment, off the highway, totally out of sight. But the car's down an embankment about 12 feet, upside down, and Tanya Ryder is hanging upside down, still in that car, seven days later. Rescue workers are in shock. They check inside the car to see if Tanya is alive. 170, start heat. We got movement. We got movement. County, I need an aid car, please. Okay. This is that missing female, Tanya Ryder, that was on the news. We found her vehicle, and she's still moving inside of it. Oh, my God, this was a car accident. I think a car accident, and she's been trapped for this long. Okay. Wow. Tanya Ryder has been in a terrible car accident and has been trapped 10 feet below the highway. Almost unbelievably, eight days later, she is still alive. The car was on its side in a precarious spot, driver's side down, so she was um, on her side for eight days, hanging from the seatbelt. The airbags had deployed. We opened the door and uh, made contact with Miss Ryder. She was on her left side, suspended by her seatbelt in her seat, unable to reach anything, and she looked like she was hurting. She was just laying very quiet and um, just asking for help. Officers on the scene report the stunning turn of events to King County headquarters where Tom Ryder is trying to rule himself out as a suspect. They give him the news. He said we found her car. It was at that moment, the moment that I almost collapsed, and I said, is she all right? Miracle survivor, a woman missing for eight days, turns up alive, trapped in her car, thanks to her cell phone. A woman who was missing for more than a week has turned up alive just as police were getting ready to question her husband about her disappearance. Her seatbelt suspended in her car. Ryder was dehydrated but conscious. Firefighters carefully remove Tanya from the car. She has been without any food or water for eight days, and she is suffering many severe injuries. She was then placed in the back of uh, the medic unit and then airlifted to Harborview Hospital. Her organs had started shutting down because of lack of water intake. She had broken bones. They thought that she was going to lose her leg. She was in horrible shape. Doctors tell Tom that in a few more hours, Tanya might not have survived. My wife is in critical condition and fighting for her life. Because of the way she was pinned, and they're hoping not, but they may have to take one of her legs. The only thing I ask of them is to give her the best chance. Miraculously, doctors save Tanya's leg, but her condition remains critical. Hours after the rescue, Tanya Ryder wakes up in the hospital. The first thing I remember is waking up and seeing a nurse next to me and feeling very thirsty. 
I wasn't aware of what had happened to my body. Tom and Tanya's reunion is emotional for both of them. I didn't really understand everything that was going on, but when I saw Tom, I saw my comfort space. I knew everything was going to be OK. She recognized me, and I saw tears well up in her eyes. Her expression softened, the tears started to flow, and she knew that I was there. And I love her more than I love my own life. It was a big relief, but it was also absolute pain to see my wife bandaged from head to toe. Tanya's car was found less than six miles from their home in Maple Valley, a fact that haunts Tom to this day. I drove right past where she was off the road and couldn't see her but I didn't know it. I drove right by her lots of times. I didn't know it. In the aftermath of their extraordinary ordeal, Tom struggles to balance gratitude with rage. She was in that car for eight days. All I know is no one else should have to go through what she went through. When the simple pinging of a cell phone could have led him to her an hour. One week after Tanya's rescue, the King County Sheriff holds a news conference and apologizes to the riders for the limitations of the Sheriff's Office in this particular case and for the frustrations Tom endured. 